Hello, welcome to Tea and Books, everybody. Um, I don't have, I'm not sitting in the big comfy chair today, I just realized, so I'm sorry about that, but it is there behind me. I just wanted to be a little more upright today, and I don't have any tea with me today either, um, because I had a really huge coffee, and I think I'm all caffeined out at the moment, but welcome. And uh, I just wanted to give you a little update. Um, you may, may, may or may not know that we have started uh, gradually to reintroduce some in-person programming at the library. Um, and most of that right now is based around vaccine passports due to um, the regulations that we're following from the province. But we have uh, returned with our movie nights so if you are interested in finding out more of that, you can check our website at www.skugoglibrary.ca or you can call or visit the library. And uh, we are also next week starting our children's programs and we will continue the Tea and Books Online this month and next month, but we are hoping in January that we will be returning to an in-person Tea and Books as well. So um, as long as everything continues to go really well, hi Vivian, um, as long as everything continues to go really well, um, then um, that's good news. Hopefully come the new year, we will be able to return to some in-person programming. Um, so that's exciting news and I just wanted to share that with you. So I'm doing obviously today's and Kyle will be doing um, the online December version of Tea and Books and then hopefully we'll be able to get back into in-person Tea and Books come January. Um, so today I'm going to talk about some really fun books and I'm going to start off with one that you may not have heard of but I just, it was a delightful read. It's called Fishnets and Fantasies and this is a Canadian uh, book and it is uh, by Jane Doucette and uh, it's based on the surprising premise of a... Um, a couple who live in New Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, and if you've never been to Lunenburg, I would recommend it. It's a lovely, lovely town. I've been there a couple of times and beautiful houses, beautiful place. Um, but the basis for the book is um, a couple that uh, the lobster, um, the lobster fishing husband is retiring and his wife decides that she wants to open a sex shop in Lunenburg. So it's a, it's a very, very funny book and it deals a lot with um, something that you don't see very often, which is why I thought it was such a fun book, which is sort of romance in um, the, uh, what shall we, what should we call it? The, the mature years. So there's a lot of people that are involved in it. It has that lovely kind of small town feel where you've got all kinds of characters and their stories and all of the characters are really interesting and delightful. And um, it just has this really fun premise where um, this couple is sort of struggling with this idea that the wife is absolutely sure that there needs to be a sex shop in Lunenburg and she's the person to do it. And uh, you get to go through and see what the mayor's reaction is to that and uh, and how people in the community are responding to the idea and everything. And uh, it's just a, a saucy, um, funny romp of a book. And there's just so many delightful characters in it. So I'll just read a little bit so you get an idea of how much fun it is. The last thing Paul Hebb expected his wife to say when he told her he was ready to quit lobster fishing was that they should open a sex shop. It seemed a bit of a leap, given that they lived in a tiny, tourist-friendly Lunenburg. With a population of around 2,300, it was hard to imagine where you could discreetly situate a den of iniquity. You can't be serious, said Paul. This isn't some red light district. Oh, I'm serious, said Wendy. Dead serious. Paul had been making a living as a lobster fisherman since he was 18. It had been important to his mother that he finish his, edu finish his education, so he did. While he fished from the end of November to the end of May, 
Wendy taught yoga at the town's recreation center. For 30 years, she'd also been selling her coastal shore small batch soap at the, lo at the local farmer's market on Thursdays. Specialty shops in Halifax also carried it, but as a side hustle, the profits made it more of a hobby. The Hebs were high school sweethearts who had tied the knot at 22. They never had much extra money, but had managed their lives around raising their only daughter, Ellen, who was deep into a master's degree at Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax. It came as no surprise to Paul that his wife harbored a burning desire to own and operate a small business. He was just horrified to hear that desire was the focus of her ambitions. The conversation about opening a sex shop took place that May on the final day of fishing season. What Paul didn't realize was that Wendy's idea had been gestating for much longer, more than a year in fact. It had struck her like a thunderbolt when she and Ellen went to see the play Pleasureville at a theater in the city. Wendy had been mesmerized by the feisty main character, a woman in her 20s with a master's degree in human sexuality who decides to open a sex shop in a small town. Although she was decidedly a few decades older, she felt strangely empowered by it. In a newspaper article, the young playwright had said she'd been interested in what it would be like to open a sex shop in a place that had no anonymity. That's Exactly what Lunenberg needs, thought Wendy, applauding enthusiastically as the actors came out for their curtain call. Wendy had two good reasons to press Paul to support the venture. Number one, after graduating from high school, she had been set to start a business degree at Acadia University. A month before moving day, she got cold feet, concerned that Paul would lose interest in his career-minded girlfriend and their long-distance relationship. Although it had been her decision to drop out, a small seed of resentment had been planned. Over the years, Wendy had continued to water it occasionally. Number two was more serious, a lot more serious. The previous spring, Paul had blindsided Wendy with a confession. During a depressive episode, he had blown their retirement savings. Every last daughter, dollar gone like a wisp of wood smoke caught by the wind. They were drowning in debt. For the better part of a year, while Wendy was occupied elsewhere, Paul had driven to Bridgewater to play the video lottery terminals. Today, he still couldn't say what had compelled him. He had only played VLTs a few, time before, few times before at bachelor parties. A combination of entertainment and escape, he guessed. To avoid being a regular fixture in one location, he had spread himself around. A couple of pubs, the hotel, the legion, better for people to think it was an occasional harmless hobby if he saw someone he knew. Sometimes he would win and that had felt good, great even, so he'd kept returning. Paul had played the VLTs while Wendy was selling her soap at farmer's markets. Because he handled their finances, he was able to keep the mounting losses from her. When his anxiety was so bad that he could no longer sleep, he spilled his shameful secret. You did what? said Wendy incredulous. It's not as bad as it sounds, Paul said, trying to soften the news. I wasn't addicted or anything. I was just messed up. Messed up? That isn't messed up. It's insane, as in you need professional help. I don't need no shrink or pills. In the past, Paul had refused to see his doctor when he was feeling down. And anyway, I can fix this. Really? How? Someone loaned me the money. Who? Who loaned you the money? Paul hadn't wanted to say, but he knew Wendy wouldn't let it rest. He tried to be vague. A, a fish plant owner, I know. There was no fooling Wendy. Jimmy Feener, are you kidding me? He's a crook and a loan shark. Now it was an above board loan bull. What interest rate? A lot higher than the banks, I bet. Does he want one of your kidneys too? You know the bank wouldn't have given me a loan. Wendy was right about Jimmy. While Paul and his men were clean, it was no secret that a few fishing crews were using cocaine to help increase their stamina and productivity. For those guys, coffee was no longer cutting it to keep them awake on long hauls. Some started with cannabis, then moved on to harder drugs. Fiener was known for bailing them out, but for a steep price. 
Oh, I'm sure it was a fair deal, Wendy had said, her voice dripping sarcasm. And how exactly do you plan to repay him? Paul had looked at the living room's pine floorboards. They were worn and needed refinishing. I put the lucky haul and my lobster license up as collateral, he said quietly. He hadn't known what else to do. You are kidding me, said Wendy, furious now, pacing and pounding her fists on the kitchen counter. That was our old age security. We're self-employed. We don't have pensions. You had no right. Paul hung his head. The skin on his face and neck flushed red with embarrassment and shame. The turmoil caused by his dishonesty and the devastating financial loss had come close to ending the Hebb's marriage. From then on, Wendy had been in the decision-making driver's seat. As self-inflicted penance, Paul let her navigate. Wendy had decided they wouldn't tell Ellen. She didn't see po the point in worrying their daughter. On the Richter scale of marital trauma, the news was an earth-shattering 10. It took months for them to even begin to start repairing the fractured fault line of trust. For better or for worse, Wendy had taken their vows seriously, and so she had stayed. Besides, she had nowhere to go and no money to get there even if she did. Beyond that, she still loved her husband. It was at that pivotal point in her life that Wendy began plotting a business plan, partly because they needed to find a way to make money, but also one year away from turning 60, she was ready to take a risk, eager to, in fact. It was her turn now. So you can see that she ends up getting into a position where she can manipulate her or her husband into the idea of launching this new shop. But it's uh, even more interesting the kind of assumptions that she and other people in town make about how everyone will feel about this store and then, um, you know, what actually happens. It's also very interesting because Paul, the lobster fisherman here, apparently was, uh, was quite the looker um, in high school and still is. So one of the fun parts of it is, is um, since all these people went to school together and grew up together, is finding out about all of the little, you know, um, crushes under the surface and um, some of the other characters that come in and out. So it's a very funny book. I would really recommend it. I don't think there's anything offensive in it. And if anything, there's some pretty empowering stuff um, in terms of uh, reaffirming the fact that, uh, that uh, passion doesn't end at you know, 30. So uh, I, I, I think it's a really fun, fun read, a delightful read, and I don't think most people will, will mind it. Uh, I would really recommend it. And uh, for another book, again, that's a very funny book and uh, a fairly recent uh, release. My next book is The Unlikely Adventures of the Shergill Sisters. And uh, this is by Bally Coar Jaswell. And uh, I thought when I, I saw it, I thought that that title looks really familiar to me. And I couldn't remember, or not the title, but the author. And I couldn't remember from where. So this is actually the author of um, Erotic Stories for Punjabi Widows. So you may have read that book when it came out a couple of years ago. Very Another very, very funny book. But The Unlikely Adventures of the Shergill Sisters is just really delightful. And it's based on um, this idea of a mother who on her deathbed writes a letter to her daughters telling them that she wants them to take this trip to India. Um, they're all from, from the UK, but um, their mother uh, originally grew up in India. And she wants them to go back and um, sort of, learn what it's like there because they really haven't uh one of the daughters has has visited but the two other daughters have never even been to india so they're sort of doing this homecoming trip with their mother's ashes however these are three sisters that don't get along very well together and um their mother was an interesting character as well and all of them start off the journey having secrets um, that they don't want the other sisters to find out. Um, the funniest one 
And, and the reason I love this author is that she, she writes, I think she writes very fresh stories. I never really know where, what's coming up. And sometimes the stuff she includes is just something I never would have thought of. And this is one of those situations. So I'm going to read a little part um, about Jasmine's secret um, that she's keeping from her sisters. Now, Jasmine is an actress and um, very, very modern and very um, um, feminist. And uh, one of her big struggles in India is wearing appropriate clothing because she's always, as an actress, she's always trying to look sexy. So she's always wearing stuff that's low cut and bears her midriff and is running into all kinds of problems because of that. And she is the host of an online or of a show that show, um, basically shows disaster videos. So she's the host of this show where she shows YouTube videos and stuff of people who get caught doing ridiculous things. But what she hasn't told her sisters is that recently she was caught on video doing something particularly odd and um, it's exploding as she's going off on this trip. Um, so I'm going to start off at the point where her, um, she's, she's starting to sit down to Google herself to find out what's going on. And if this incident has, has hit the internet yet. And, um, her, um, her agent had told her agent Cameron told her, don't Google yourself. Don't Google yourself. The voice in her head was Cameron's. He had just sent her an email urgently asking her to call him. Too late, she had replied, after the incident with the teenage boys at the temple laughing and smirking. She had immediately looked it up on the internet. I already saw it. She was screwed. The video had gone viral and she had been identified. The internet was screaming with laughter over the irony of Jasmine Shergill, the host of a television show which poked fun at people being caught doing embarrassing things on video, being caught doing something so embarrassing on video. Cameron had warned, Jas warned Jasmine that the things would happen very rapidly, but she could not have anticipated this. In the few hours since it had caught fire, there were mentions of her name on blogs, trolling comments, a particularly nasty thread on the National Geographic Nature Preservation Forum, and of course, there was the video. The first thing that came up when you searched for her name used to be television host to distinguish her from a pediatric dentist named Jasmine Shergill in Birmingham. Now it was television host Jasmine Shergill brutally murders endangered animal. Needless to say, Jasmine had compulsively typed her name into, every, into Google every few minutes today while she was supposed to be doing SIVA. She was aware of her sister Rajni watching and disapproving as she tapped away on her phone. Now she sat in the hotel, watching her notoriety multiply in the search result count. Another email from Cameron popped up. Seriously, don't Google yourself. Easy for him to warn her against it. She searched for his name once and found only three hits. One, his earnest and suited LinkedIn picture from at least a decade ago. He had hair then gave the impression that his early career was in real estate or insurance brokering. Oh, God, Jasmine uttered aloud into an empty room. Her Wikipedia page, previously only cons consisting of a short paragraph outlining her modest career achievements, had been updated. The most objective account of Jasmine's incident was headed, Arowana Fish Controversy. On July 7, 2018, Shergill was dining in Feng Shui restaurant in South London when she became involved in an altercation with her dining partner. Feng Shui, which boasts a 10-foot aquarium, hosts its own rare albino arowana fish valued at 35,000 pounds. The fish is known to be very sensitive to conflict and is prone to hurting itself when it is provoked or aggravated. 
The argument between Shergill and her partner took place near the aquarium, despite numerous attempts from the restaurant owners to ask them to respect the fish and move the argument outside. Onlookers reported that after the restaurant owner tried to steer Shergill away from the aquarium, she slammed her hand against the glass, causing the fish great distress. It leaped out of the water and onto the floor, where Shergill kicked it repeatedly. This was the most objective version of events. It was lacking in some key details. For starters, the dining partner had been Jasmine's boyfriend, Mark. Jasmine had mistakenly thought that reservations at Feng Shui meant a proposal. She hadn't allowed herself to consider the possibility that he might be breaking up with her. You just don't seem very happy with yourself, he'd said. But my mom just died. I'm dealing with a lot, Jasmine protested. It was an understatement because Jasmine couldn't put in words how she felt about Mum's death. The thought of death in general had always made Jasmine desperately want to rewind time, even when she was little. After Dad died, she found it comforting to pretend he was just in hiding for a while until Mum told her to knock it off. Mum's death was still unreal to her. She was too old for fantasies of Mum's absence being temporary, which was where alcohol certainly helped. Mark shook his head. It's been like this for a long time, he said sadly, glancing pointedly at the bottle of wine which had inched toward Jasmine's side of the table. And did the restaurant owner really attempt to steer Jasmine away? Try grabbed her by the shoulders, leaving her no choice but to flail in self-defense, accidentally knocking the aquarium. Also, she did not think that the restaurant owner was serious when he told her the, that the fish, a bloated, miserable old thing, was emotionally vulnerable. <laughs> Those had been his words. It was only after the whole incident blew up that Jasmine learned about the endangered arowana fish and indeed its sensitive nature. Part of the reason there was so much interest was because although arowanas were removed rumored to be capable of putting themselves out of misery by flipping out of their tanks, nobody had actually ever captured it on video before. When Jasmine and the restaurant owner started arguing, onlookers began filming, thinking they were just witnessing an entertaining tantrum. Now the death of the fish was taking on a life of its own. Jasmine sank back onto the bed. She could feel the vodka working now. She had hardly eaten anything all day. After finding out that her video had gone viral, she had to return to the Langar Hall and wash old breakfast plates, which ruined what little appetite she had. Across the room, the dresser mirror presented an unflattering reflection, but not an unfamiliar one. If she clicked on images, there'd be a few good headshots, but even more stills from the videos. Her brief and modest celebrity would turn into infamy now. She hadn't been on television long enough to have a solid reputation to fall back on. She was an up and coming entertainment figure once and fish slayer forevermore. <laughs> so poor Jasmine, she is trying to escape from the notoriety and all of the young people in particular that are starting to recognize her. And uh, she gets herself into some awkward situations and uh, I would really recommend it. All three of the sisters are interesting characters and their dynamics as sisters. Um, it's funny. They're colorful and uh, there's a lot that happens in the book. And uh, again, it was a very entertaining, delightful book, much like the first one. So once again, those two for anybody who came in late and missed Fishnets and Fantasies by Jane Doucette and The Unlikely Adventures of the Shergill Sisters by Bali Kouarjazwal, who, as I mentioned prior, um, also wrote Erotic Stories for Punjabi Widows, which was also a very funny, entertaining book if you had the chance to read it a couple of years ago. Now, the last book I'm going to talk about is nonfiction, and it's called Animal Vegetable Junk. A History of Food from Sustainable to Suicidal. So this book is a great, if you like nonfiction, if you like um, food, if you like um, 
history. It's a fascinating book because it's literally all of world history just from the view of food and how food affects so many things, even politics and um, science and the development of, of civilization as we know it. And um, I find it really, really interesting. It is, uh, it is more for people who do like nonfiction, but uh, I would really recommend it. It's, uh, and, and near the end of the book, he gets into talking more and more about um, the negative aspects of um, agriculture and, and uh, factory farming and the impacts that it's going to have on, on our future as well on the planet. So it's a very interesting book. I'm not going to read too much from it because I know nonfiction can be a little bit more difficult uh, to listen to, um, but uh, I'm just going to read this part where he is taking up in uh, the changes that happened after the Dark Ages. The Crusades of the 12th and 13th centuries were a turning point, and although they're rarely discussed in terms of their effect on food, we can't ignore the relationship. Crusaders were raiders, religious fanatics, spiritualists, idealists, romantics, and sinners seeking redemption. They were unemployed itinerants and aristocrats, crats, failed farmers and militarists, thrill seekers and disinherited second sons, imperialists and power grabbers, rapists and murderers, pillagers and plunderers, anti-Semites and anti-Islamists. The common thread was opportunism. For many crusaders, the reward for their service was death and, in theory, salvation. But others became traders in spices, sugar, and the new foods like rice, coffee, a variety of fruits, and more, as well as fabrics, tools, and crafted items. These new commodities were the foundation for the world of exploration, trade, colonization, and exploitation that was about to explode. But the spread of wealth was delayed by the plague, which arrived in Sicily in 1347 on ships coming from the east, a direct result of increased international trade in the wake of the Crusades. The Black Death killed at least 20 million people, ruptured European society, and paved a path for change. After Europe's population was reduced by around a third, some scholars say half, food was relatively plentiful. But the surviving nobility, dependent on a massive peasant population for income and, of course, labor, was suddenly squeezed for cash. With fewer peasants paying rent and taxes, landlords pivoted to trade as their primary revenue source. This created a heightened pressure to maximize the land's potential to yield goods for exchange. If it were ever a priority to nurture the people who worked that land, that priority was all but extinguished and the ruling class accelerated the process of enclosure, making communal lands private. Enclosure ruptured traditional feudal arrangements under which peasants had been guaranteed that they could remain on their land regardless of its output and almost always had at least a little acreage they could work for themselves. With the closure of the commons, their livelihoods became dependent on the profit generated by their crop or, increasingly, their flock or herd. In any case, the value of whatever they produced was often determined by a distant market and ever-changing conditions. Land owners may have been thriving, but the new cash economy didn't help most farmers or eaters, and those who couldn't produce food for themselves were always at risk of starving. Animals which provided meat, wool, dairy, fur, tallow, labor, manure, and more became an important source of wealth. There's a reason farm animals are called stock, like shares in a company. Thus, pasture became a more reliable investment than arable land. In England, writes the mid-20th century Dutch historian Slicher van Bath, whole villages were wiped out to make room for grassland where the flocks could graze. But animals were cultivated to feed the wealthy, not the pe peasants who reared them, and the peasants were increasingly limited in their ability to grow food for themselves. This would have disastrous consequences extending across centuries. 
As more land became pasture, that which was used for crops became not only less abundant, but also more stressed and less fertile. Ongoing monoculture, especially of wheat, says Braudel, devours the soil and forces it to rest regularly. Yet it wasn't being fallowed or otherwise replenished, which virtually guaranteed that each year's crop would be worse than the last. Peasants were losing land to animals that they couldn't eat and working soil that was decreasingly productive, yet their numbers were growing. How exactly was that supposed to work? With no solutions in sight, Europe began to look beyond its borders. So, like I say, if you like nonfiction, which I do, and if you like history particularly and are interested in what um, the impacts might be or seeing what the future or future and past look like through the lens of food and farming. This is a really interesting book, so I would really recommend it. So those are the three books I had uh, for today. Once again, Fishnets and Fantasies by Jane Doucette, The Unlikely Adventures of the Shergill Sisters by Bally Coir Jaswell, and Animal Vegetable Junk, A History of Food from Sustainable to Suicidal by Mark Bittman. So for those of you who joined us a little later, I will give the update again that I gave at the beginning of this, which was basically that we are doing uh, this Tea and Books online, and then we will do the next one in December online, and that will be Kyle doing that one. And then starting in January, we're hoping to bring it back in library. We have restarted our movie night programs um, for people who are fully vaccinated. And uh, if you want to know more about the movie nights, uh, I think they're happening every two weeks on Thursdays and you can find out more on our website or you can call the library or visit. And um, other than that, our children's programs are starting in person next week. And hopefully in January, we'll be starting some to return more and more to in-person programming. So uh, I hope that's as exciting for you as it is for us. We're very happy to be able to do that. And we hope everything continues to go well so that we can continue on that path. So thank you all for dropping by to watch today. And uh, this will be saved and posted on Facebook if you want to watch it again from the beginning if you came in late. And uh, it will also be posted on our YouTube channel so you can look for it there. Thanks a lot.